I hate climate negotiations. Now, maybe this isn't the best way to kick off this year's climate negotiations, COP27, which start either in a couple of days time or right now, depending on how quickly I edit this video. But the truth is that I'm not feeling this year's pre-negotiations hype. In fact, if anything, I'm prepping myself for a roller coaster of disappointment. This year's negotiations are being hosted by Egypt and hope to bring much needed focus to the African continent. Continent. This is much needed because African countries in general have contributed amongst the least to the climate change problem and yet are set to suffer the most severe consequences as the climate continues to change. Anyone who has followed these climate negotiations for a number of years knows two things. Firstly, yes, they are vitally important. But secondly, they are so much talk and so little action. And so this year, rather than list every single thing that these talks may or may not achieve, I thought I'd put the talks in context and list some of the most controversial things that have ever come out of COP. I'm Climate Adam, a climate scientist with a doctorate in atmospheric physics from the University of Oxford, and here to help me make this video a little bit more entertaining, keep things moving along and ask me questions, is an alternate version of myself. Well, it's good to be here. Well, thank you for making the time. Now, do you get me to ask the questions because you think it's funnier, or because you can't get anyone else to be in your videos? Let's get started, shall we? Now, first on my list of controversial things that have come out of climate negotiations is the Paris Climate Agreement. Pretty bold move starting with the biggest single achievement in all of climate change policy. But the truth is that the Paris Climate Agreement is awesome, but it's also awful. Please clarify. So the Paris Climate Agreement brought the whole world together to agree that we need to work to stop climate change. Not only that, but it incorporated a limit of just 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. This limit was barely being spoken about at the time, but we now understand would be vital to help protect us from some of the worst impacts of climate change. Yeah, I've got to be honest, all of this is sounding pretty good so far. But here comes the awful. The Paris Climate Agreement basically says that countries can do pretty much what they want to fight climate change. And in a shocking twist that no one could possibly have seen coming, countries are not doing nearly enough to fight climate change. Back at the time, I compared this awesome, awful combination to a school kid who says that they're going to get an A plus in their next exam, but is doing nothing to actually study for that exam. Duh. The world is currently heading for well over two degrees Celsius of global warming, which to be fair, is a massive improvement from where we were headed before the Paris Climate Agreement, but is simultaneously a massive worsening of, well, worsening of the planet's climate conditions. Okay, so up next, we've got a two-parter, sponsorships. Wait. Sponsorship. Don't you just hate that moment when you're watching a video and it suddenly segues into what turns out to be an ad? Yeah, and then I feel stupid for not realizing sooner. Well, you can always boost your ad spotting skills with Ability Bucket, where you can- I've made this joke before. It's a good joke. It's a fine joke, at best. But weren't you going to explain what sponsorship has to do with climate negotiations? Well, that weird feeling you get when you realize that a brilliant video you're watching is actually just an ad for brilliant. Imagine that for an entire climate negotiation. And that's because cops have corporate partners. Okay, that does sound uncomfortable, but what's so bad about, say, an offshore wind company sponsoring the climate talks? And that brings us to the second part, who these sponsors actually are. And this year's climate negotiations features a paid partner who is consistently ranked as number one in the world for plastic pollution. Coca-Cola. Yeah, well, I can see why people would be shocked that negotiations that are meant to protect the environment are accepting a sponsorship from a company that is consistently harming the environment. And yet when I first heard about this Coca-Cola sponsorship, I wasn't shocked at all. What, because you love single-use plastic? No, it's because I'm so jaded by who the sponsors were 
in the past. And who were they? Actual fossil fuel companies. The companies that are producing the product that is driving the problem. The companies that in many cases have misled the public about the problem. Actual fossil fuel companies have been sponsors of the climate negotiations. And I'm not talking about COP number one or COP number two. This happened all the way up to last year. COP26 in Glasgow last year was the first to say no to these fossil fuel sponsorships. All right, so that's progress. Well, I guess so. But even without these sponsorships, fossil fuel companies still had the biggest delegation at last year's summit. Oh. Next up, cash. A hundred billion dollars in cash, to be precise. Wealthier countries promise this sum annually to lower income countries to help them adapt to the devastation of climate change as well as decarbonize their own economies. And this promise wasn't just a vital tool to enable lower income countries to deal with this problem that they didn't cause. It was also a crucial symbol of trust. I've got a feeling things haven't gone too well for this promise. Nope, the promise was indeed broken and rich countries didn't stump up nearly as much cash as they had promised by the deadline, which shows just how much you can trust their words at these negotiations. In fact, this $100 billion topic is going to be a major feature of this year's climate negotiations. Again. Okay, so this next one is going to need a little bit of explanation. Journalists. Wait, aren't you a journalist? Let's not dwell on that. Journalists from all over the world descend on the climate negotiations looking for the next big shiny story, whether that's breaking news of progress on pledges or an incredible new deal. The problem is there aren't often actually big breakthroughs and the shiny new deals, as we've already learnt, often aren't as shiny as they first appear. Please provide a concrete recent example. I would love to. Take last year's negotiations, which saw headlines like an end to coal and announcements that 190 countries and organizations had pledged to end their coal use. Both these things might understandably lead you to the conclusion that the world had agreed to stop burning coal. But look a bit deeper and you see that only around 40 countries had committed to stopping burning coal Coal, and the language in the final agreement that all countries signed up to was heavily watered down. So is your point that we should just abandon climate negotiations? Of course not. The negotiations have achieved great things and provide an invaluable stage for the countries of the world to fight it out. I'm not drawing attention to all these fails because I think the talks are useless, but because they could be so much more useful if we can peer behind that smoke screen. So why exactly did you make such a negative video? Because the talks are so ridiculously overhyped. Every year there's a long to-do list of what we hope the talks will achieve, but we overlook the fact that last year's talks failed to tick off so many points of its to-do list. Okay, so are you going to tell us how to actually improve things? Well, the truth is that progress is being made both within and outside the conferences. We've seen protest movements, including the school strikes, which shot to fame at a COP a few years ago, shift public attitudes. By amplifying honest climate conversations and by making our perspectives on the climate crisis clear to world leaders, we are starting to shift down that mercury on the thermometer. And when are this year's negotiations taking place? Well, in theory, the negotiations will last from the 6th to the 18th of November, although that is a bonus thing that annoys everyone about the climate talks, which is that they always overrun. What are these COP negotiations actually like to be at? Well, they're pretty weird. Although, to be fair, I've only been to one, which was Katowice in 2018. And to know how I felt after that, you're gonna wanna click over here. Although, be warned, I wasn't feeling particularly optimistic after that year's negotiations. Okay, until next time. Bye! Bye.